All right, let's get started. Welcome everyone to today's uh, Exploring Social Justice series event um, hosted by the American University Library. My name is Jessica Owens Young and I'm an assistant professor in the Department of Health Studies here at AU. The Exploring Social Justice series, a program started in 2014 by the American University Library is co-sponsored by the Center for Diversity and Inclusion and the Case Spiritual Life Center. The series brings to campus exemplary leaders from diverse backgrounds who have advocated for various human rights and social justice issues. There is a full list of the speakers on the library's event page with registration links. So today's event is the seventh of the 2020 to 21 program. Now, just for some housekeeping items, please submit questions for the speaker during the talk using the Q&A function. Submitted questions will be addressed at the conclusion of the presentation. So now I'm going to introduce today's speaker who I'm very excited to hear from today. So today we have Dr. Deidre Cooper Owens, the Charles and Linda Wilson Professor in the History of Medicine and Director of the Humanities and Medicine Program at the University of Nebraska, Lincoln. Her book, Medical Bondage, Race, Gender, and the Origins of American Gynecology by the UGA Press published in 2017, won the 2018 Darlene Clark Hine Book Award from the Organization of American Historians as the best book written in African-American women's and gender history. So today, Dr. Cooper Owens will present The Long Arm of Slavery in the Development of American Gynecology. Dr. Cooper Owens. Thank you so much, um, Professor Owens Young uh, and to the American University Library staff for inviting me and in organizing this event and even for uh, the tech team uh, who is providing this platform for all of us to, to share and discuss and the captioner. So thank you very much. I'm very excited to be a part of your speaker series. And so without further ado, I'm going to share my screen with you. So often people, you know, they think slavery and gynecology, what in the world does that have to do with each other, right? Because often when we think about the kind of long march towards um, medical development and progress, we don't think about the institution of slavery. And in this country, however, when you start to have things developing in the 18th century, the 19th century, particularly in the South, slavery tends to be connected to that. But there's also a legacy of that institution and the growth of this particular branch of medicine that still, you know, it's still with us. And so that's what I really want us to do today, right? put in conversation the past and the present and to think about some of the ways that we can see ourselves out of the legacy of medical racism. So when I talk about medical racism, most folk are not shocked to know that there were people in the 19th century who had you know, these really explicit views about black and white people being distinctive from each other biologically. One of the most well-known and some might argue notorious uh, medical physicians, thinkers and writers of his day was a Dr. Samuel Cartwright. And Samuel Cartwright really uh, you know, becomes prominent nationally when he publishes an article about the peculiar diseases of the Negro. And this is in the antebellum era. So this is the era before the civil war. And Samuel Cartwright, you know, he, he doesn't just do this because he's bored. It's the state of Louisiana. In fact, the Louisiana State Medical Association asks him to, to do this study and then publish his findings. Because th th these folk were really grappling with this question. Was slavery, uh, were, were Negroes, as, as Black people were called then, were they fit for freedom or fit for slavery? And that also boiled down to questions of the body and biology. So Samuel Cartwright writes this article about the peculiar uh, diseases of the Negro. One of those diseases was drapetomania. Some of you may have heard of it, but he says that if an enslaved person even harbored the thought of running away or ran away, that enslaved person suffered from a mental illness called drapetomania. 
There were a few others uh, that talked about dirt eating, that the Negro was more prone to eat dirt. I mean, all of these kinds of things, right? That there's a thicker, darker membrane under the skin of the Negro than the white person. And so this seems quite normal, you know, pretty average for people to have these kinds of beliefs, right? About people who existed on the lower rung of society. But where Cartwright's real legacy comes in is he's one of the first physicians to perform a study that looks at the racial differences of black people and, and enslaved people for Cartwright and white people. And he does this through the spirometer. It's a medical instrument that measures lung capacity. In fact, it's used today. So Cartwright finds in his study that in fact, right, the Negro has a lesser lung capacity than, than, white, uh, than white people. And then in fact, it, uh, the Negro is, is inferior in this way. And he's not the first person to, to, to state this, right, to assert this kind of scientific or this medical fact about, uh, about Black people. Thomas Jefferson wrote about this diminished lung capacity in his only book, Notes on the State of Virginia. And even today, today that legacy is with us when we go to the doctors. And, you know, you, you can be white, you can be Black, um, whatever racialized group you're in, and you breathe into the machine, right? And the, the second picture that you see to my right on the screen is a picture of a book by Lundy Braun, um, a medical anthropologist at Brown University who, who writes about this breathing race into the machine. But even today, just like the 19th century, you breathe into the spirometer and guess what? Let's say I have the same reading as a white woman. If the doctor forgets or the technician forgets to press the button for black or white, right? Then they can't accept that our readings are the same. They literally have to manipulate the machine and press black for me, white for the other person. Even though they know that race is not uh, a biological thing, right? It's a really a social construct, but that those buttons, depending upon which race you represent, literally then reconfigures the reading, right? And that has all kinds of implications, whether one is considered a person who has pre-existing conditions, insurance prices. So medical, the legacy of medical racism, born of a time when people held these kinds of um, racial fictions, we would call them today, about black and white people still permeate. And so often people will say, you know, when, when I first started giving these talks a few years ago, but I don't understand, you're talking about the past. And I was like, ha ha. But there are studies from the 21st century, not studies from the early 20th century, but the 21st century. And UVA, as many of you know, amazing school. In fact, I did my postdoctoral fellowship at UVA, right? And it's an elite institution. And their medical school is considered one of the best medical schools in the country, right? It's highly competitive. And Kelly Hoffman, when she was a PhD student in the Department of Psychology, decided she was going to do a, 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 a research project. And she really was interested in these perceptions of pain. So in 2016, in fact, it was April 2016 when this was published. So the study isn't quite five years old. So it's pretty recent. She sends out a, a study of medical residents, students, physicians, asking them to decide whether patients with the same symptoms experience pain in the same way. The only difference was one patient was white, one patient was black. And overwhelmingly, white medical residents, students, and physicians believed that there, there were just uh, biological distinctions between black and white people, that black people didn't experience pain. And if they did, it was very minimal. That black people aged faster because of their biological differences. That black people had thicker skin. And it literally mirrors, right? The same thinking of someone in Samuel Cartwright's time or Dr. James Marion Sims, who I'll talk about a little later. And so for me, I'm thinking, these are not students who are coming to UVA medical school from junior high or high school. They have bachelor's degrees, right? They completed undergraduate school, and yet they still come in with these, these incorrect beliefs, right? These falsehoods 
around biology and biological difference. And so knowing that this existed, right? I really was brought into the conversation through the uh, contestation of James Marion Sims's legacy. Now, when I wrote my book, I didn't intend for it to be about James Marion Sims. I wanted it to be about the history of American gynecology, but from a different perspective. How do we think about the development of this med medical branch by privileging the patients? And I was looking at enslaved people, but I was living in New York about three years ago and my book hadn't come out yet, but I started one August uh, morning, I started to get a lot of messages, texts, inboxes, and they're like, hey, did you plan this, this protest? And I was like, what are you talking about? In front of the Sims statue. Sims' statue was in uh, Central Park and Sims was considered, or you know, still is by some, the father of American gynecology because of pioneering work that he did in terms of repairing uh, a, a particular um, common ailment called vesicovaginal fistula, which I'll get into a little later. So Sims's statue was uh, in Central Park, right in East Harlem. That's a neighborhood that's populated by a lot of um, Latinx people. And uh, also right across from the New York Academy of Medicine for which he was a president. And so a lot of local protests had arose since about 2008 around Sims' statue, but things really came to a head when members of the Black Youth Project 100, the New York branch, uh, decided to <clears throat> uh, have an artistic and political protest in front of the Sim statue. Some of you might be familiar with this picture. It went viral on social media and it really highlighted uh, the tensions that New York residents, particularly, particularly in East Harlem had with Sims's um, kind of memorial presence there. And so I was then brought into this, right? And I, I kind of, as an academic, I was like, I just want to write about, you know, the history of slavery and medicine. I don't want to be asked these questions. But journalists were really interested in my thoughts, right? Should the statue stay or should it go? And I'm not saying the symbols don't matter. They, they most certainly do. But I knew in my role as a history professor, as an author, as someone who wanted to tell a more holistic uh, version of American history that included all of the historical actors, I really wasn't interested in answering those questions, right? Whether it should stay or go, because it was either going to stay or go. Ultimately, the statue was removed uh, less than a year later on my birthday, April 17th, uh, 2018. But what I was able to do was really have journalists um, grapple with, number one, the context of the time, but also B, to talk about Right, the, the medical legacy, uh, I mean, I'm sorry, the legacy of medical racism and how this country has become such a dangerous place for Black women and Black birthing people to have children, right? And I'll offer some of those stats towards the end of the talk. And so I didn't play nice when they would ask me questions because I didn't like the questions. They were always either or, right? Is Sims a monster? Was he a savior of women? And I'm like, things are much more complicated than that. And so my book was released and all of a sudden, I became known as the country's foremost historian on James Marion Sims. And I knew that this was an opportunity to really explain the landscape of antebellum slavery, uh, to explain uh, the roles of enslaved patients and laborers, and to also provide some context around the growth of medicine during this time and the changing conceptions of white masculinity and manhood, right? That these doctors were also dealing with in the 19th century. But I started with one critical question because I heard comments from every camp you could think of, those who defended Sims, those who criti you know, criticized Sims, those who were saying all kinds of things about Sims. Um, in fact, yesterday on a panel, I, I, I just didn't have the heart to, to correct uh, some of my, my panelists. But they were like, Sims was the one who invented the concept that Black people didn't experience pain. And I was like, no, in my head, no, he didn't. Like, I wrote a whole, a whole book about this. No, he didn't, right? If we're talking about something that's structural or systemic, we cannot make one person a historical boogeyman. And so my thing is, if you're implicating Sims, you have to implicate everybody. And so what I really wanted to do was tackle this notion of exceptionality, right? Was Sims... The, the most brutal, 
with Sims intent on um, mangling and destroying the reproductive parts of enslaved women. And, and all of, you know, did he try to intentionally get them addicted to opium? I mean, all of these kinds of things I was hearing. And I thought this is a wonderful platform to do what historians do best and that's provide context. So when we think about whether James Marion Sims is exceptional in his treatment of enslaved women, I point people to the first chapter of my book. And I go all the way back to the 18th century, sometimes a little, a little farther back, but largely to the, the latter part of the 18th century. So the 1700s, especially the 1780s and 90s. And I start talking about a man named Georges Cuvier, arguably uh, the Atlantic world and, and certainly France's uh, most respecting kind of leading natural historian or scientist. And he was, from my perspective as a historian of medicine, he becomes really interesting to me because of his treatment of Sarhi Bartman. And she was known as the Hottentot Venus, right? And so Sarhi Bartman, known as the Hottentot Venus, leaves South Africa, is brought in, and I mean, doesn't leave it, <laughs> her owner essentially sells her uh, to two new owners. And she becomes this kind of, um, I don't know, object, right? This kind of human freak show in the ways that she's treated. And largely it's because of the size of her buttocks. And after being in London for a few, a few years, she's then sold to an animal keeper. You heard me right, an animal keeper in France. And that's how she enters under uh, the uh, kind of medical care of Cuvier because she's kept in a menagerie at the National Museum of Paris. That's where plants and animals were kept. And Cuvier is really interested in whether she is the missing link between humans and primates, right? Why are her buttocks so large? In fact, she couldn't just have a big butt. In fact, it was a, considered a medical pathology called steatopegia. I mean, all of these kinds of things, right? Because of this intense interest of her, her body. And when she dies and Cuvier performs the autopsy, guess what he finds? Nothing, that she was a normal human being. In fact, her skeleton was the same. Everything was the same, right? She, there, was, there was nothing about her that was different. And so I, I begin with Cuvier because I think it's a, a wonderful example of showing how these ideas around you know, biological difference and, and, and sometimes similarity between black and white people developed in the Atlantic world uh, largely in the 18th century. And then I moved to Ephraim McDowell, considered the father of the ovariotomy. He performs the, the Western world's uh, first recorded successful abdominal based uh, operation. And he then starts to do experimental work on enslaved women in the state of Kentucky, right? And he writes an article about it almost 10 years later. I'll go into that. Um, and there are some comments that are made by his peers around these perceived differences of black women in particular. John Peter Mattel, another early pioneer of gynecological surgery. In fact, working on, on patients suffering from the same conditions that James Marion Sims's patients did. He did this in the 1830s. So here we have uh, early 19th century with Cuvier and McDowell, 1830s, John Peter Mattel, and then Francois-Marie Provost. He is French born, moves to Haiti, begins doing exper experimental work on Haitian, uh, Haitian enslaved women, um, trying to perfect the C-section or the cesarean section. The Haitian revolution is about to start. And so he skedaddles and he moves to another former French colony, now a, a, a state, uh, Louisiana. And guess what he does? He continues experimental um, work or, or surgery on enslaved women in Louisiana. And a part of the legacy of Provost's work is that Louisiana from the 19th century, the antebellum era, all the way to the 20th century becomes the, the state that offers and does more C-sections on black women in slavery and freedom than any other Southern state. So there are these linkages that exist, right? And I'm saying all of these ideas that we have and we're trying to place on one person, they were already in existence. So oftentimes these, these men were literally inheriting a cultural practice and a way of thinking and being that had already existed in the Atlantic world. So Ephraim McDowell is the first person, you know, that I kind of go in depth with 
Virginia born, uh, he was a slave owning physician. He uh, essentially performs the first ovariotomy where he removed a tumorous ovary from a white patient. Uh, he does so kind of to the, the consternation and the critique of the townsfolk in Kentucky where he lived because he had an earlier incident of grave robbing where he essentially robs the grave of a recently uh, expired enslaved man and he performs an autopsy and he literally, I mean, the town just goes wild because they see this as highly unethical, but he was also stealing property, all of these kinds of things. So his parents send him to Scotland to get educated in Edinburgh, he comes back. And uh, when he meets this, this white woman patient, Mary Todd Crawford, he says to her, I think you might have a tumor, but I'll have to make an incision, an, an abdominal based incision. And the townspeople find out they are outraged. So he sneaks her into his hospital, or really his hospital is in his house, right? So his medical office. And with the assistance of her husband, he removes an ovary that's over 21 pounds. Amazingly, this woman lives to tell the story. No anesthesia, right? Because this is 1809 um, and she survives. And it's amazing because people don't even know about germs, right? Germ theory isn't a thing yet until several decades later. And so Ephraim McDowell then decides he needs to perfect this surgical technique. And so he literally in Kentucky that has a really small black population then and even now, he decides to kind of collect cases and he does so on uh, what were called negresses. And so four out of the five of them that we know of were enslaved. One was considered a free woman of color and one of his patients dies. Well, he finally, eight years later, after he performs all of these experimental surgeries, he publishes his article and he thinks he's gonna get America on the map because this is amazing, right? No one had ever performed this surgery and a patient lived. He is panned, he's ridiculed. And one of uh, Britain's leading physicians, a Dr. Johnson, writes in The Lancet, right? It, the Lancet is still in uh, publication today. In fact, I just wrote an article that'll come out on the 27th for The Lancet, but the country's leading uh, medical journal in, in England and this person says, well, of course, these surgeries were successful. He operated on negresses and they bear cutting with the impunity of dogs and rabbits. So this idea that black people, black women in particular, didn't experience pain, but also that they had this fecundity, that they are reproductively fertile in a way that other women aren't, right? Like dogs and rabbits, animals that reproduce in litters, right? And very easily. And so, you know, when people are once again saying that one person created this, I'm saying no, right? This is the Atlantic world. People from Europe are also, you know, exchanging these ideas about black and white biological difference. We then have John Peter Matara, who I mentioned, also a slave owning physician. And he is confronted with an obstetrical fistula case. What is vesicovaginal fistula as, as it was called then or obstetrical fistula as it's called today? Well, it's caused from a traumatic birthing injury. Uh, I can't talk today, injury. Um, and what happens is when the uh, woman is in the, in the throes of delivery, right? The delivery is prolonged. And that means not a few hours for days right, on average, about two, three days. And as she's trying to expel the fetus, right, there's all of this friction. Imagine trying to push, right, the fetus out, but it's, the fetus isn't, isn't coming out, isn't being pushed out. And so there's this friction in the upper vaginal area, which creates fistula or holes. So there's, there are holes and there's also tearing. And above the upper vaginal area is your bladder. So, you know, I've read some things where they're like, it was deadly. No, it was not deadly, right? But incontinence was the result. And if there's tearing in the uh, anus, there's also incontinence there too. So when you're talking about enslaved women, you're talking about a real decrease in the value of these women. You're also talking about social ostracism because of the stench, there are infections, all kinds of things. So John Peter Matar, who is a very prominent uh, doctor, and uh, leader in the community. In fact, he founded the Randolph-Macon 
College of Medicine. It's no, no longer in existence, but he founded that school. He's, he decides he's gonna perform experimental surgery on a white woman patient and a black woman patient, pretty similar, right? And they're both suffering from this obstetrical fistula. Well, he applies silk sutures to the white patient and the black patient. And the white patient fortunately is cured using his language, right? The language of the day, he fixes her, he cures her. And so that means she's able to, you know, uh, live a life where she's not incontinent, where she doesn't have these, these kind of holes. Um, the enslaved woman is not. And he says over eight clinical trials, he continues to try to close these holes, right? To, to apply different kinds of sutures, nothing works. He finally publishes an article about his experiment and the medical outcomes. And in a moment of really, you could tell frustration for him. But for me, it was such a, a honest moment. He writes, the patient could have been cured had she stopped engaging in sexual intercourse. And one is thinking, sir, you're a Virginia slave holder. What enslaved person can just say, I own my body and I am going to stop engaging in sexual intercourse, particularly if it's forced, right? What if she is married to a, a, an enslaved man? And that's the way that she expresses her love and her intimacy. But beyond that, enslaved people still had to work despite being ill or sick or deformed. And so today we would say, is he accounting for the social determinants of, of slavery and how that impacts her health, right? But Sims reads that article. And so Sims is not the first person, you know, to attempt to correct this, but he's the most famous. And in fact, when you talk to most people, they, do, they can't even tell you what he actually did. They just know he experimented on, on enslaved women. They don't even know about his experimentation on Irish and uh, immigrant women in New York in the 1850s. And then there are like all of these kinds of ideas about Sims. And so I'm like, let me just kind of let you know a bit about Sims. He is, uh, he was born in upstate South Carolina, attends medical school there, but it's not quite what he, he thought it would be. So he transfers to Jefferson Medical College in Philadelphia, which is still in existence. And then he moves back to upstate South Carolina, Lancaster, begins his practice. And Sims is essentially, you know, kind of working on the townspeople, but something unfortunate happens. Two Negro infants die. And this is quite common for the 19th century, but it kind of ruins his reputation. And so he gathers his family and packs them up and they move out west. And what that means is Alabama. And this is where Sims really enters the historical record, right? He, he has to kind of build himself up from the bottom. And as he says, you know, he gets to start working with, as he says, poor whites, Jews, and free inwards. Um, and as he builds up his reputation as a, a well-respected doctor and a skilled surgeon and doctor, he starts to uh, get contracts with, slave, uh, with other slave owners who actually have larger farms or plantations. And so one slave owner, a Tom Zimmerman, sends an enslaved woman to Sims who lived in Mount Meigs, Alabama at that time, a kind of little outpost of Montgomery. And she's suffering from obstetrical fistula. This is the thing. Sims is not a doctor who, as he says, is even concerned with women's issues or conditions. And so he, he says, I can't help you, right? I don't do this. And because her slave farm is, uh, is a bit away, she stays in his, his medical office overnight. But during that time, a white woman comes in. She has fallen off a horse. She's in extreme pain. Sims kind of doesn't know what's going on. And so he asks this woman, Mrs. Merrill, can I examine you? Once again, this is the 19th century. Most male doctors are not performing vaginal examinations or even looking at the, the genitalia of women, especially white women. But he asks her permission. He's able to see inside the vaginal cavity and he discovers that her uterus is retroversed as he writes. And so he says he remembers something from his med school class. And what he remembers is that if you open up the vaginal cavity far enough, a rush of air can come in. And all of a sudden that rush of air turns her uterus upside, you know, to the right side up, so to speak. Now, when I tell this to, to medical students, doctors, nurses, everybody laughs, right? But I'm like, hey, he wrote it, not me. So he then has this idea, what if I can examine the vaginal cavity? 
And so he does so with this enslaved woman who's there, Lucy. And he takes two pewter spoons and he says, I saw as no man had seen before. And then he canvasses the county going to slave masters and saying, hey, do you have any slaves suffering from this condition? Um, if so, I'll take care of them um, until I can do experimental work to fix this condition. So he collects about, as he says, a little over half a dozen. We, we estimate that it's probably eight or nine, eight or nine women that he either owns or leases. <clears throat> now, some of the defenders have said, well, Sense was really compassionate. He took in these women and he took on all of the costs. I'm like, you know, there was a thing called hiring out, <laughs> which means essentially you can lease slaves. Like it's a contractual agreement that has nothing to do with compassion or benevolence. It's a business exchange because slaves are considered property, chattel, movable property, right? The only difference is unlike a chair or a, a teacup, you're talking about human beings who are legally defined as movable property. So Sims is entering into a very common practice, right? That has nothing to do with his kind of um, benevolent feelings towards enslaved people. And that's where I really wanted to correct some of the older versions of folk writing about this who had no understanding of slavery. Two of the most famous uh, slave, you know, enslaved people who experienced this kind of hiring out or leasing of their bodies and their services. Harriet Tubman hired out at six years old. Frederick Douglass, right? So this is a pretty common practice. So what Sims does after he collects those uh, eight or nine women, right, for his, for his uh, experimental research, as he says, he has a little hospital built for himself. Now he later finishes the experiments in Montgomery, but this is a hospital, uh, a picture of it from 1895. During that time, it was still considered a Negro hospital. It's very grainy. He sold it to one of his former surgical assistants, but there's a little, to my left-hand side, there's a little child, a little black child at the bottom of the picture. If you look a little bit above that, you'll see a woman kind of bent over a laundry tub and in the center, right above the bush, you see an elderly man, right? So, you know, he has his enslaved laborers to build this hospital. And he, he not only corrects the, the, the um, you know, kind of surgical technique after a nearly five-year period, um, he, instead of using silk sutures like uh, John Peter Mattower, he tries everything, lead, I mean, just everything you can think of, think of right, cotton. And he finally settles on uh, silver sutures. And that's what he uses to kind of stitch or suture together those, that fistula. He also, he never, he doesn't in, invent the speculum. The speculum had been in use for thousands of years. But what he does is, as he says, he perfects the speculum he, that he calls the sim speculum, very much a medical entrepreneur as well. And that, remember those two pewter spoons? Well, the sim speculum allows for greater, uh, you know, greater observation when you're performing that kind of, uh, that kind of um, examination. And so here are all of these technological innovations that are being made. Here are all of these surgical techniques that are being discovered and created. And this is the interesting thing. Sims's surgical assistants change. The first two and a half years or so, two white men, right? They're princessing for him, they're educated, literate, all of these things. But Sims keeps failing, right? He's unable to heal these women. And so the men are losing money, the community has lost faith, faith, and Sims writes, they withdraw support. And so he then does what most slave owners do. Guess what? He trains his patients, these enslaved experimental patients, to also work as nurse, his nurse, nursing staff, but also his surgical assistants. Now, this is where, you know, for me as a historian, I'm like, oh, this is really interesting. Because the reigning belief about women is that they're a subset of men, they are, their brains are not as developed, right? And that they think from their uteri, not logically. So here you have black women, but they're also enslaved. And black people, regardless of kind of sex or gender, were considered to be intellectually inferior. And that was a function of biology. But this is the thing, there's a kind of racial cognitive dissonance. People can have a belief in something, they can even write it. But what's the actual practice? He didn't go out and find more white surgical assistants. 
he trained these enslaved women because slave masters knew, right? The slave owners knew. Slaves, you know, enslaved people did good work and they were in fact smart. And so I often joke, here was this team of, you know, illiterate surgical assistants and nurses who were also his patients who also helped him to create this surgical technique. Right where the two two white male surgical assistants couldn't, and so you know, of course, you know, one doesn't think about it in that way if you don't privilege right the the other historical actors who are the enslaved women. So after the surgical experiments end and he finds that they're successful in 1849, about a few, three years later, he publishes an article called "On Vesicle Vaginal Fistula." And all of a sudden his career takes off. He is famous. He moves to New York, you know, by the 1850s, founds a hospital called the New York State Hospital for Women. And it was considered the first hospital in the country. And I'm saying, wait, how can it be the first hospital in the country if the hospital that he had built for himself in Alabama, where he discovers this and where he only dealt with women patients, why isn't that considered the first hospital for women in the country? Right? What happens when you erase the, you know, kind of erase Black people from this narrative, but in particular, you erase slavery from the narrative? And this is the thing Sims is writing, doesn't erase it. In fact, he's pretty transparent and honest about who worked for him and with him and who his patients were. But when you start to have a narrative on page, but the pictures don't, you know, they, 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 they are not you know, describing or depicting what the words say, people then say, oh, even though he says Negro, even though he says slave, even though he writes servant, the pictures all of a sudden, even the commemorative articles that come out, almost all of those pictures are of white patients and nurses. And they also follow the politics of respectability of the day. So when Sam Sims had these public, uh, you know, kind of public, displays of his surgical prowess in his hospitals. He, you know, in Alabama, he had uh, these enslaved women on the table. They were naked. There were throngs of people, right? So it was, it was public. Um, and the other nurses were working alongside him. But here in this picture, right, that appears in a medical journal, the patient is covered. She has on shoes. She's white. Um, in fact, the nurse is inserting the medical instrument. And so there's this little literal erasure. And so by the time I write the book, people are like, wait, American slavery and American gynecology were linked? And I'm like, yes, right? It's literally right there, no pun intended, right, in black and white. Um, and so I'm going to wrap up here. But there were also some things, right, that I wanted to really talk about in terms of the framing of Sims as kind of the exceptional medical subject and all of the, the kind of misinformation, right? The kind of, well, he gave these women opium and he was trying to addict them, addict them and why wouldn't he give them anesthesia? And I'm saying, do you not understand surgery in the 19th, in fact, medical care in the 19th century was really risky for everybody. But when you're performing surgery, the one thing surgeons have to go in and do, I mean, they go in quickly, and those patients are conscious, even if anesthesia was around, because the thing is anesthesi anesthesiology as a branch of medicine doesn't exist yet. And so people don't know measurements, there's nothing scientific about it. And if you put a patient into what was considered twilight sleep, they could bleed out. And there's no communication to the doctor, right? That the patient is still alive. So most doctors in the 1840s are not relying upon anesthesia because they need to see that the patient is still alive and not bleeding out. And also they need to be really quick, right? With the surgical technique or removal of, you know, the, 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 the body part or organ. So that's number one. People didn't write about addiction as we understand it today. Sims, just like every other doctor is giving an, uh, you know, opiates to patients for one reason. When you have a hole and you're suturing it, guess what you don't want to happen? You don't want that fistula to become a gaping hole again. You don't want that suture to break. Guess what opiates do? They create constipation. And so if the patient 
is in fact constipated, they're not going to break the suture. So those are the practical reasons. And so for me as a historian, I'm like, we don't have to invent things, but we can talk about some of the biological ethical issues that emerged in the 19th century. Sims writes in his memoir, The Story of My Life, how the white community withdrew support. When I looked at the 1850 census record of the enslaved uh, folk that he owned and or leased, there was one woman, we don't know her name, who gave birth to a mulatto child. During the experimental trial, Sims is the person who is legally in charge of this woman and yet some white man, we don't know who it is, could have been Sims, could have been some of the surgical assistants, could have been this woman's owner, we will never know because the census record can't determine a paternity. But what it does show is around the same time that Sims writes about the withdrawal of the white community support, an enslaved woman becomes pregnant with the only slave listed on the census as a mulatto. And so ethically, what does this bring up for us in terms of these kinds of questions, right? So those are the things that I'm like, we can actually look at the historical record and talk about ethics, you know, not necessarily the kind of uh, misinformation that's, that was floating around. And so that also brings me to the last point, right, around the legacy of medical racism and maternal health. In slavery, there was a concerted effort, particularly after the Constitution bans the Atlantic slave trade in 1807. So but from 1808 to 1865, uh, the government, slave owners are all concerned with the natural increase of Black enslaved children. And, you know, so there's this concerted effort to try to maintain and or create Black reproductive health because enslaved women passed on their condition to their children, right? That was a colonial law that becomes then a law of the land as the United States becomes a nation. In freedom, that changes. All of a sudden, black children who were considered assets, right? Because they helped propagate this economic labor system are now seen as financial burdens. And so the state does not have a, a kind of, um, concern about maintaining Black women's reproductive health as they did in slavery. And so the legacy of that is today, the United States is the most dangerous place for high earning uh, countries or high earning income countries, typically called developed nations, the most dangerous place in the developed world for Black women to have children. Black women are three to four times more likely to die from pregnancy related complications. So the mortality and infant mortality Maternal morbidity and infant morbidity um, are literally unchanging, right, over the past few decades. But what we have now found, and Black women reproductive justice activists have been kind of stating this for decades, and finally medical practitioners and physicians and medical associations are finally saying, oh, maybe, maybe they were right. People are now seeing it's not this kind of biological difference or flaw, right? That makes black women somehow more vulnerable to maternal mortality. But what in fact, it, it, what in fact uh, creates those kind of damning statistics that I mentioned was racism, right? From the UVA study to people's own um, narratives around how they were treated. So Rachel Hardiman wanted to get some hard data. She looked at over a million cases Rachel Hardiman is a professor and a researcher in the School of Public Health at the University of Minnesota, one of the country's top um, public health schools in the nation. And after looking at these million cases in the state of Florida, she found this statistic that when black newborns are born, and the maternal mortality rate, the infant mortality rate, and I'm including morbidities here, cut in half, cut in half, right? So more evidence that racism is this factor, right? So when you literally have doctors who are not operating from a kind of anti-Black bias, not believing in these racial fictions and gender fictions around biological difference between Black and white people, right? These patients have a greater chance at living and not experiencing these complications. And so what I'm really trying to have us do in this conversation of the past and the present is think about how we can situate these women, not as just objects, but as subjects and people whose lives we want to save in 
the richest nation, right, in the, you know, in, in the world. So I thank you. I welcome your questions and your comments. Thank you so much for that fascinating presentation. I was diligently writing notes um, as you were speaking. And also Dr. Hardiman's um, work is amazing. So I'm glad that you were able to bring her into the conversation. Um, so I do have a question from the audience. And the question is how, if at all, have black doulas or doulas of color played a role in ensuring basic dignity for black women in the birthing process? Oh my goodness, it's been huge. Um, I have to be honest, in terms of really being um, pulled in to do the kind of advocacy work, because I was really afraid, you know, I was like, oh gosh, I'm a historian and, and I don't want to be brought into these kinds of political conversations because people will think I'm not objective. I mean, just all of this, this foolishness, right? But there's a kind of safety of, of being ensconced inside the ivory tower and black, mid, um, black doulas, especially. Um, and midwives, but especially black doulas were like, no, we've been doing this work. We need to know the history. We need to understand that the things that are happening now are not new. Um, we need to, to let people know that there are precedents that are rooted in a past where people believed really dangerous things and that's still being propagated. And so where I was in New York until literally just a, a year ago, um, black doulas, there are now programs um, that Bill de Blasio helped to institute because of the activism that black doulas and midwives um, established there where uh, you have um, the New York City government um, having doulas work with mothers who are in more vulnerable and kind of fragile living environments. Um, there are, in fact, I work with two um, doula training programs. So Chanel um, with Ancient Song Doula and Latham of Mama Glow. In fact, that's the program that I worked with yesterday. I know that my book is a part of required um, educational reading for their students. So it's not just in the, the medical colleges and universities or the schools of nursing, but also doula programs have also instituted this as a part of um, their educational work. And so doulas are really leading the way. They can't burden this alone, but in terms of the kinds of platforms around holistic healing and education and treatment, I think it's really important it's also um, important to note that there's a lot of resistance to doulas from the established medical field, um, especially if you're talking about places that are more rural, um, you know, and that is a problem. But I'm, I'm really happy about the political advocacy that's happening around doulas and doula training programs. So thank you for that. Absolutely. I think one aspect of, of the, uh, I don't want to say reemergence of doulas, but they've always been here, right? But more attention being paid to doulas, um, I think it's important that one aspect that they bring to this conversation is that they humanize Black women, mm -hmm. right? It, it's not some type of abstract construct, right? They, they really see the person and help others see the person. Mm -hmm. And your last point really leads to um, the next question from the chat. Um, how does the medical industrial complex or like financial gain related to hospital births, for example, suppress home births or, or doula birthing? Mm -hmm. You know, it's, it's, that's an interesting question. It was one that was asked yesterday too by um, a couple of folk in the chat. And what is interesting is, oh, it was antagonistic. And in fact, hospitals didn't want to entertain it. Um, I remember when I was still in grad school and I had a research fellowship um, the program is no longer in existence, but a research fellowship right in DC at the American College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists in Southeast. I mean, I'm sorry, Southwest. And um, I remember going back to LA, which is, which is where I went to grad school and um, having a conversation with my neighbor who is now a black OBGYN. And I was saying, hey, you know, what do you think about home births? Cause I, you know, I was like, well, if I ever have kids, I'm thinking home births. And she was just like, no, it's dangerous. It's, I mean, just all of this stuff. And I was like, wait, so the only way that women can have birth is, I mean, experience birth or birthing people can experience birth is that is in a hospital. And so now it's interesting, we've reconnected and she's so embarrassed because she was like, girl, now that I'm an OBGYN, I have very different beliefs and thoughts because hospitals we see from these statistics can be very dangerous places. 
hospitals are now being shamed and embarrassed because the statistics are unchanging. But when you literally inject or you insert black midwives and doulas, black OBGYNs, you literally insert these people. These black women and black birthing people are, are not dying. They're not suffering the pregnancy complications and hospitals are now having to really reckon and grapple with that. Um, and so all of a sudden, I don't see them doing it as much with doulas. Um, I still think that the, you know, the people who represent um, the MIC or medical industrial complex are still um, viewing doulas as unqualified. Um, but I do see these partnerships forming with midwives. Um, but once again, how, how do hospitals explain these statistics? The data is, I mean, the data is what it is and it's been unchanging. Absolutely. And that um, really relates to a question that came up for me during your presentation regarding um, Sims um, working with the enslaved women as part of his medical team or his research team, which is something that I was unaware of prior to this conversation. But what it made me think about was the relationships between midwives, Black midwives in particular, and um, physicians in the early 1900s and how physicians relied upon, you know, the Black midwives knowledge to further advance mm -hmm. their own knowledge and then shunning midwives or even making it, you know, criminal or illegal to yeah. be a midwife. And I was wondering um, if there's any evidence in the historical record of Sims relying on the enslaved women's knowledge about birthing, um, because we know that enslaved women were the people who were um, supporting birth, you know, on plantations and, and things like that. So I don't, I don't know. I was just wondering if, if he learned anything. I mean, I, so in terms of the historical records, I don't know. I can't, you know, I can't answer it because this is the, the this is the ironic thing. When you are a historian of slavery, you are literally writing a history about a people who didn't leave written records because they were not allowed to read or write. And so the very few records that we have tend to be those memoirs that are not that extensive. Um, so almost all of the records, excuse me, are from white medical men, white men who, white men and women who owned, you know, black people. Um, and so, you know, there, there's always going to, to be a kind of one-sidedness, uh, you know, when you, when you're examining those archives, so from um, those documents, excuse me. So for me, when I'm looking at these words, I'm often trying to see where the tensions exist, right? Or is there a moment of kind of racial cognitive dissonance? Sims doesn't really write about, you know, him um, learning anything from, from enslaved people, um, you know, that it doesn't really crop up in his writing. Things. But there are others that I've noted in the book, right? Some some other um, owner, you know, kind of slave only physicians who would talk about their relationships with some of the midwives um, in their community, and you know, it was almost always around pharmacology. You know, they would say, "Oh, you know, um, this woman was doing this thing, you know, but I did try out her, you know, I did try out her recipe, and there seemed to be moderate success, you know, like that kind of thing." So you do know that they were aware, and some of them were even testing out and using the the kinds of compounds and recipes that these that these midwives and these nurses, these slave nurses, um, created. Thank you for that. And uh, someone shared in the, the Q&A that their sister had a very traumatic birth experience in a military hospital. And then after the baby was out, they took a long time to notice she was hemorrhaging. And that reminds me of these stories that we've been hearing you know, more recently about Black women and um, complications during and after birth in hospital settings, even you know Beyonce and Serena Williams having these issues. And I wonder if, um, that's related to uh, perceptions about um, Black women's health and perceptions about um, the narratives that uh, Black women are telling when they are trying to tell the doctor that, hey, something is wrong and there's a disbelief. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's, you hit the nail on the head. There's a disbelief that, 
that these patients aren't lying, I mean, are lying. And it goes, you know, the black maternal health crisis is just, I think, kind of the most transparent one. I mean, it's really transparent, right? There's, I rarely get resistance um, because people, you know, back in the day, they would say, well, black women are just they're fat. They don't eat well. They have poor diets. They don't visit their doctors. And I was like, the average American woman wears a size 16. So how is it that fat black women or fat black working people are still suffering and, and white women who are fat, right? Or white birthing people who, who are considered obese and eating the same kind of processed food diets that most Americans eat, they're, they're not suffering these complications. And I don't want any person giving birth to suffer the com these complications, but what's the difference? And the difference was really, and now we know at the ways that these, that black women and black birthing people are being treated, they are not being believed. They are not being seen, unfortunately, as, as worthy of, of value and belief. Um, and so when you literally have stats to show just the entrance and the integration of black medical workers, birth workers into black people's lives helps save their lives. I mean, I think that's, it, it's beautiful and yet it's tragic, right? Um, and this goes kind of across the board when we think about it. Um, we, <clears throat> excuse me, when we think about the ways that chronically ill um, black people have, you know, been thought to be lying or simply wanting to hustle, hustle these doctors to get drugs. Um, I, may he rest in peace. My, my first love, my little high school and college boyfriend, I mean, I have always had a little thing for nerds, right? He, he was like salutatorian of the class, won a you know, full scholarship to, to undergrad, um, becomes a math teacher. I mean, just has the master's degree, all of these things, right? And it just looks like a little nerdy guy, even after we grew up, right? And married other people, looked like a little nerdy guy. And I remember <clears throat> before he died, we, we reconnected as friends and um, he was really suffering. He had sickle cell. And um, he said that he literally has to carry letters on his person or had to before he died, carry letters on his person to prove to doctors that he was not a drug addict. And I'm sitting here like, your eyes have been yellow since I've known you, since you were 13. Jaundice, I mean, just one of the, 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 the features that a lot of folk with sickle cell have, you've gotten blood transplants, you've had this and that. He literally still had to carry with him letters from doctors and also have these people's phone numbers because healthcare providers thought he was trying to gain them for drugs. And I just, I thought, even if he was on drugs, if he has sickle cell, he still needs medical attention and care. And so it's this kind of dehumanizing way that the medical industrial complex treats black patients where you come in for care and you're being harmed, right? Um, you're not being believed. And so, you know, it, it, when I hear these stories, none of it is surprising. It's actually quite embarrassing. Um, and so finally, at, at least I'm hopeful because there are enough conversations like this there are enough bills you know, um, that are being introduced by senators and representatives all across the nation where people are finally taking very seriously what black women activists started to um, advocate for in 1994, right? With reproductive justice. Absolutely. Um, another question uh, relates to um, and they ask, I'm curious about the efforts being made at the university level, like med school or nursing um, programs and other health professional programs to instill anti-racist practices for when their students go and work in, in healthcare settings. What have you seen develop in the field? It's, so, it's interesting. I'm kind of like, I'm one person. I mean, this is a, this is a sad reality, right? There are, well, I'm one of two black women who have an endowed professorship in the history of medicine in the country. The other is in DC, um, who's a mentor of mine, Dr. Vanessa Northington Gamble at George Washington University. Um, she's also an MD PhD. So she does her MD work in Philly, which is her home, and then does her university work and research in DC. Um, but that's it. It's just us in the nation. Um, in terms of medical humanities programs, I, want, I run a traditional one. Um, and there's another black woman at UCLA who runs one. So in terms of even having black people who know about this, 
being able to consult or advise. There, there are just not enough of us, you know, who, 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 enough of us involved in this kind of advocacy work, right? I mean, it's less, less than five in terms of those administrative positions and, and positions where we actually have the resources to be able to do this work. But what I can do on a small level is um, a lot of medical colleges, doula programs, schools of nursing have adopted my book, books like Dorothy Roberts, Don, Donna Ieen Davis's Reproductive um, Injustice, Loretta Ross and Lynn Roberts, all of those. So they're adopting books that are now just not, you know, not only a part of core, uh, cultural core competencies, but they're required reading. Um, so that people understand that there's a history around the reluctance of black people to really trust medical providers, um, that it's not just their belief in some silly superstition, um, that you know these studies are coming out that are literally saying what Black people have been saying for centuries, hey, we're being treated different, <laughs> people think differently about us, but it sometimes hits harder when they see that it's, it's kind of quantitative data. Um, so those things are being done. I know I'm working with a number of um, institutions like ACOG, some hospitals, some schools around helping um, them develop learning modules, having this kind of um, anti-racist training be just an integrated part of the educational process. Uh, so th those are the things I'm doing on a, a kind of individual level. But a lot of schools have reached out and they're at least interested in trying to, to create this. Um, you know, we just have to keep pressing them. Absolutely. Um, this makes me think of, uh, you know, you titled your talk using the legacy of the long arm of slavery. Um, and it makes me think of how a particular le legacy is related to how we think about pain or biology and how it manifests differently um, across people in general. Um, and I'm, I'm still formulating this question in my mind, but I'm really interested in hearing about your perspective of the role of ideology and ideas and how that's related to how we could possibly uh, get white hospital staff, as a person is asking in the chat, how do we get white hospital staff, including doctors, to see Black people as humans? Oh, what a great, great question. I often say people have to be committed to raising their children not to be anti-Black, anti not to be misogynistic. I mean, it's like the most simple thing, right? And so I know it might sound harsh, but I'm like, the students at UVA, literally are coming in educated. They, I mean, they represent a smaller portion of, of the United States because most Americans don't have a college education. So not only are these people already educated, that meant that these people excelled in their undergraduate institutions. So they should have this knowledge already around, you know, these things that we just take for granted, right? They should understand ethics and and morality and compassion, but they come in and they're literally saying, black people have thick skin. They don't experience pain. Ultimately, they're different. And this continues to be worked out. Um, that kind of anti-blackness is worked out in very creative ways because the one function of racism that it is not static, it is dynamic and evolving all the time. Um, and so all of a sudden you then have people who feel kind of fatigue talking about race and racism um, because it makes them feel bad. But I'm like, your guilt doesn't supersede these people's lives that are harmed or, or snuffed out. Like you're feeling bad for a moment should never be privileged over people who are actually dying where the stats have been in place about the black maternal health crisis for decades. I mean, that shows, right, that people are really unwilling to kind of unpack what anti-Blackness looks like. And sometimes they have these kind of beliefs that it's someone in a white sheet and a pointy hat, and that's not it at all, right? It's the ways that you come in and you see a sickle cell patient as being a drug addict, as if someone who abuses drugs and alcohol, you know, doesn't still need care and compassion and attention. Um, it's the ways that there is concern shown for, you know, in, in another kind of public health conversation too, 
when I lived in New York, um, I'm a member of a sorority and I remember we would go to Albany and we would talk to different representatives around certain initiatives, like trying to get the font larger on, um, you know, the, the uh, polling, um, I forget the little sheets, you know, where you vote, trying to get the fonts la larger so that people with visual impairments or who are older could see you know, the, the names and the bills, you know, the, the descriptions, those kinds of things. Um, it, so it was kind of things like that, but it was so interesting when we would talk to certain um, congressmen and representatives, or well, I should say state senators, excuse me, representatives in New York and the ways that they allocated money for white people who had been suffering from opiate use or overuse. And you know, I'm old enough to remember, I was living in DC when DC was considered the crack capital in the eighties. Um, and thinking about the only kind of um, outreach to those folk was jail, literally jail. There was no funding. There was nothing poured into rehabilitation or recovery centers. They went to prison. Um, and I thought, my gosh, where did this compassion come from? Oh, okay, the face of uh, the opiate user, whether right or wrong, is a white face, whereas the face of the crack user was a black face. And so all of a sudden, now we're talking about recovery. It's those kinds of, of hypocrisies, right? Um, and so that's what we're, we're finding with the black maternal health crisis. Um, yeah, so it's, it's just, I think people just have to, to be honest about, about their anti-blackness. Um, and stop acting shocked when Black people have literally been saying the same thing for centuries. I wrote an article um, just last Saturday in the Washington Post about medical racism, and I could literally find, you know, similar experiences from the 18th century all the way up to the 21st century. Black people have literally been saying the same things. Hey, we're not, we're not pathological. Please listen to us. Please stop treating us in a way that's different from other people. So that's that's really what it is. Teach people to be compassionate and not anti-Black or misogynist or classist. Strong agree with that. Um, and I think another thing that we need to recognize is how this anti-Black sentiment is perpetuated, not just among individuals, but you know the, the social factors like our media and how the media portrays um, black folks and, and the impacts that has on our conceptualization of, of black humanity or, or not in this country. Um, a few folks have shared some um, stories in, in the Q&A related to um, treatment. Uh, one person shared a story related to their, their labor experience and said, I can relate living in North Carolina in 1990 and being in labor for 21 hours with my baby having, I, I don't know if I'll pronounce this correctly, but meconium aspiration. Mm -hmm. The doctor on call was white and would not perform a cesarean. The next day, a black doctor came on and immediately rushed me to emergency and saved my baby and myself. Mm, yeah. <laughs> Thank you for sharing that. Um, another person wrote the other issue that is not addressed is the effect these things have on medical practice in Africa. Doctors in developed countries follow uh, guidelines from ACOG and the British counterpart. And like right now, Douglas or traditional birth attendants are taboo in Kenya mm -hmm. because of, of the West. Mm -hmm. um, and that that is really interesting. I wonder how um, conceptualizations of uh, the Black body and, and Black health in the United States can shape international yeah. um, treatment. Yeah. I'm not sure if you've done work, you know, internationally. No, I haven't. There is a, um, she's a colleague of mine and she's doing amazing work, not on East Africa, but West Africa. She looks at Nigeria in particular and kind of um, the politics of birth um, and medicine and the state kind of intervening in certain, in certain ways. Um, her name is Oge Chukwu, Oge Chukwu uh, Williams, and she's at um, Creighton University. C-R-E-I-G-H-T-O-N, I think. Um, but it's in Omaha, Nebraska. But she's doing some, some work that deals with West Africa. I just don't know enough because I'm, I'm a US historian, um, but that does not surprise me at all. Um, 
you know, and the thing is, you that's the thing, you don't want to model it after this system because it's one that's in fact dangerous, you know, when it comes to people of color. Yes. Um, another question is, do other people of color experience the same kind or level of medical experience as do African Americans? Uh, do white folks experience subpar medical experiences in places that are primary non-white, like in Africa or Asia or not? Oh, there's no research, no. <laughs> no, so that's an easy question to answer, no. There's no research that shows that. Now, do white people experience um, unfair treatment in all white spaces because of their poverty? Yeah, you can look at Appalachia, those kinds of things, yes. Um, there are enough studies um, done on that. But in terms of like a white person being in Japan or South Africa, no, they're not having adverse health outcomes. Um, in terms of other people of color, yeah, um, Native Americans, oh my gosh, jeez, you know, the ways that um, pre existing conditions, I mean, it just brought on by a lot of things, but the kind of social determinants of health mirror that of um, you know, African-American communities. I, I think there's a lot of underreporting in, in these communities because oftentimes, you know, kind of based on that whole black white you know, dichotomy that we seem to have in this country around research is almost always black and white um, and never really other groups. We are not learning a lot. And I think there's just underreporting. But when we look at um, Latinx people, um, you know, in the Southwest, uh, on the Eastern Seaboard, and some of the urban areas like New York, you see some of the same figures. You know, so oftentimes in spaces like LA, New York, you'll you'll see like black and brown, right, um, kind of put in in conjunction with each other because they're experiencing the same negative health outcomes. I think that's you know related to again ideology and how these ideas are exported. <laughs> from um, the United States internationally, this I idea about whiteness as the default or whiteness being held in a superior um, position. So mm -hmm. yeah, I, I totally see that. Um, I, I wanna wrap up with um, one more question. And this question is, is really about your research methods and, and your research. So what led you to write this book and where do you see your work going next? Oh, yeah, I, um, you know what? I wrote the book because I, I went to um, Bennett College, which is a historically black college for women. Um, so I had always been interested in black women's history. I then got an MA at another black college in Atlanta, Clark Atlanta and knew that I wanted to do something. I, I wasn't quite sure I wanted to be a professor, but I knew I wanted to do something with like the black historical experience. And there was something about also growing up in South Carolina, I grew up in DC and South Carolina, but growing up in South Carolina um, and listening to stories that my grandfather would tell me, or, you know, my family had been in the same two counties in South Carolina since the colonial period, since the 18th century. And so, you know, walking with my granddad who was born in 1911 and him pointing things out for me, you know, I now, you know, hindsight is 2020. I'm like, oh my God, I guess I always was in preparation to be a historian. My dad worked at the National Archives. My mother has done genealogy in our family to the colonial period. So there, the seeds were kind of planted. By the time I was graduating from Clark, I, I was pretty certain um, I wanted to be an educator. By the time I went to UCLA, I just knew black women and in, in slavery. I, I wasn't sure. And then I read a book by Beverly Guy Sheftel, um, who is at Spelman. She might have retired, but she's at Spelman, one of the architects of, of the womanist um, theory. And Janetta Cole wrote a book called Gender Talk. Changed my life. Um, I was going to present. I was moderating a panel um, with Janetta Cole and Reverend James Lawson. And if, like any good person, I did, you know, did my research and I saw two or three sentences. And I said, who is James Marion Sims? People were experimenting on in slavery. And I was really angry because I'm like, I went to two HBCUs. I called my mom, who was a science teacher, has a degree in biology. And I was like, did you know about experimentation on Black people, on Black people besides Tuskegee? And she's like, no, just Tuskegee. This is before Henrietta Lacks becomes kind of commonly known. And I thought, this is a great dissertation topic. And that's how I got into it. Now, who could have predicted that when I graduated in 08, that by 2017, the world would be interested 
in like the removal of a statue and that my book would come out during that time. And who could have predicted that there would still be an ongoing black maternal health crisis. And so people kind of think I just wrote the book yesterday. And I was like, no, it's, you know, it was my dissertation. It was kind of a long time coming, but, but it hit at a particular political and cultural moment that makes it resonate with so many people because unfortunately there's still a lot of similarity um, in the kind of stories of old and experiences of enslaved women and unfortunately um, black women and birthing people in the 21st century. So that's how, the, to answer the last part of it, I am doing a biography, a popular biography of Harriet Tubman who was thought to be infertile. So I'm looking at her as a disabled person and, and really gonna be thinking about this issue of her infertility, possibly, we don't know, but also as a victim of a traumatic brain injury. And so it'll really be the first book written on Tubman, you know, through the lens of disability and medicine. But also it's, some, it's kind of fun because she, you know, two husbands, the last one was 20 something years younger than her. I mean, just all of these, all of these wonderful things about this brilliant woman. I'm, I'm really excited to begin that project. That sounds amazing. Thank you. And uh, thank you again for this presentation. Um, so I'm sure I shared a sentiment of the audience. I really appreciate all the knowledge and, and wealth of knowledge really that you brought to us today. So I'm just gonna wrap up by um, letting everyone know the next speaker in the Exploring Social Justice series will be Professor Paul Wapner on Thursday, March 18th at 1130 AM. Dr. Wapner will present Is Wildness Over? based on his book published in 2020. Dr. Wapner is a professor at AU School of International Service. His research focuses on global environmental politics, environmental thought, um, environmental ethics, and environmental activism. He is particularly concerned with understanding how societies can live through this historical moment of environmental anticipation in ways that enhance human dignity, compassion, and justice, and come to respect and nurture the more than human world. He has published six books and dozens of scholarly articles in the area of global environmental politics. And you may register for this program through the library events page. All right, so thank you, Dr. Cooper Owens. Again, I look forward to, to reading your work and your future work, and I hope that you do take care. Thank you, you too, bye-bye. Thank you.